Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Bill Beckner, Chair of the Faculty Council. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce William Powers, Jr., 28th President of the University of Texas at Austin for the 2014 State of the University Address. Thank you all for coming and joining us for this important annual report. We hope that you will be able to stay for the reception, which will be held immediately in the lobby following the address. Bill Powers is a remarkable leader for our university with accomplishments that range from enhancing the undergraduate curriculum and encouraging diversity to providing critical support for high performance computing and the creation of the new Astronomical Observatory in Chile. This will be his ninth year as president and his 38th year as a member of the UT community since joining the law school faculty in 1977. Over the span of his term as president, his guidance and instinct have led to a multitude of accomplishments for the university. These include curriculum reform for the core undergraduate program, creation of the School of Undergraduate Studies, improved graduation and retention rates, initiation of the Dell Medical School, success in the capital campaign with more than $3 billion raised, major new building projects that change the face of fundamental research on our campus, and critical support for teaching and research that has ensured international recognition for UT's quality. Much more than that could be said about his remarkable vision for higher education and UT's role in Texas. But most important, as faculty, students, and staff, he is our friend. Please welcome President Bill Powers. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Bill. And I'd like to start today with a story. Uh, it's a story about a cold and dreary day back in February of 1977. I was at the University of Washington in Seattle, and my phone rang. My best friend from law school, Guy Wellborn, was teaching at the UT Law School. And he asked me if I wanted to come to Texas. That phone call changed my life. So in August, I got here in an unair-conditioned uh, un Fiat, <laughs> pulling a U-Haul trailer. And I spent the first night at the old Villa Capri Motel, where the football practice field is today. Elvis Presley died the next day. And in the next few weeks, I began to discover what a truly remarkable and special place this is. You might say that I fell in love. When I became president in 2006, I told alumni they could teach me a lot. And the alumni certainly have taught me a lot. But they didn't, teach me, they didn't need to teach me to love UT. That happened all the way back in 1977. UT is one of the truly great teaching and research universities in the world. It started first as an idea, an idea by a group of visionary Texans in the 1860s, and then as an actual fact in 1883. And even then, it was blessed with an endowment of university lands, first in East Texas, and now, thank heavens, in the Permian Basin. And so UT grew from a local college to a regional and then national and then great world university. I've actually been here for more than a quarter of that journey. And I've been blessed to lead UT for almost nine years now. I've seen the impact of the Centennial Commission, and the Commission of 125. I've watched UT raise its sights with Peter Flan's War on, on Mediocrity the Commission of 125's Discipline Culture of Excellence, and hopefully with my own claim that B-plus is our biggest enemy. 
and that we should work every day to make UT the best public university in America. And to be immodest for a moment, I'm proud, I'm proud of what we've been able to do in the last eight and a half years, largely following the beacon set before us by the Commission of 125. We focused on our undergraduate's education with the signature courses, the School of Undergraduate Studies, and the system of flags that helps our students navigate through the ecosystem of courses over four years. The Freshman Research Initiative in the College of Natural Sciences puts 800 freshmen, yes, freshmen, in real research laboratories with faculty and graduate students doing real research. Students who take these courses do better in their other courses. So-called at-risk students improve even more. We've taken advantage of technology to develop online and blended courses, flip classrooms, and MOOCs. We're using learning analyti analytics that some of these formats enable to further fuel these improvements. We're trying to simplify the pathways through our majors to help students graduate on time. We've done all this to ensure that when our students set foot on this campus, they'll see the world, as Congressman Jake Pickle said, they'll see the world for the first time in Technicolor. We've given department chairs more responsibility for strategic planning and leadership, and we've recruited strategic thinkers into those positions. Today, we have the best group of department chairs and deans in my 37 years on the 40 acres. We've budgeted our resources in more selective, disciplined ways so that we can focus on what matters most, our faculty's research and our students' success. I've called this the money ball approach, and it's made a big difference. We've built more than 3 million square feet of new facilities, and we've dramatically renovated and retooled almost 2 million more. These buildings allow us to do more collaborative research and to teach our students in new project-oriented ways. And we're building a new medical school, the first one to be built at a tier one research university in decades. It'll transform healthcare, healthcare delivery, healthcare education, and healthcare research in Central Texas for years and years to come. We become a much more diverse campus, and we've successfully defended the need for diversity in the, in the Fisher case. We've established the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies, and the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis. And we're currently establishing a Department of Mexican American and Latina and Latino Studies. External research grants have grown from $477 million in 2006 to $634 million in 2013. And during the last eight years, we've received a total uh, external research grants of an astonishing $4.5 billion. 18 faculty have been elected to the National Academies, and our faculty have won the Steele Prize, the Japan Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, the National Medal of Technology, the Turing Award, the Wolf Prize, and countless other awards. Athletics income has grown dramatically, and millions upon millions of those dollars have supported our academic mission. And of course, we just finished the campaign for Texas. It began during the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Skeptics said, we shouldn't start. And they said that our $3 billion goal was beyond our reach. But as Gary P. Nunn sang in London Homesick Blues, when a Texan fancies he'll take his chances, chances will be taken, that's for sure. And we did it. To everyone who contributed and worked on that campaign, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. We'll see the impact of these changes for years to come. 
And crucially, the impact will be on the core of our mission, our faculty and the research they do, and on the learning experience of our students. To those who think that universities never reform themselves, that universities never change, just look at what we've done. Yes, I'm proud of what the university has done over the last eight years. Nevertheless, we face serious challenges. Too many families are still being left out of higher education because they can't afford it. The demographics and needs of our students are changing. Technology is changing how we interact with, with each other and how we absorb information. The needs of the workforce are changing. Global competition is increasing. Other demands on diminishing public resources are growing. We need to face these challenges thoughtfully and with open eyes and with steely resolve. So I'd like to focus on our future. In just 22 years, we'll celebrate the bicentennial of the Republic of Texas. Many of our current faculty and staff will still be on our campus. Our current students will be in the middle of their careers. Even I hope still to be alive. <laughs> the bicentennial is not that far away. So what will UT look like in 2036? How will we get there? What should we be doing now so that we can get there? I can't chart a specific path, but I would like to offer some broad brush observations. My first observation is that to meet these challenges, we'll need to continue to be tough-minded and disciplined. We'll need to focus on what is most important to our core mission, research and teaching. We'll need to focus our resources on being competitive for hiring and retaining faculty. And we'll need to focus our resources on improving our students' academic experience. And these resources are more than just financial. They include how we use our time and effort, how we use our faculty lines, how we use our student credit hours, and how we use our space. You know, Moneyball means that it's not enough that a product produces more and more good than it costs. It also has to be better at doing that than competing good projects. Our task isn't just to weed out bad projects from good ones, although we certainly need to do that too. Our task is to be selective even among very good projects. Our task is to select the excellent projects. Spreading resources is always easy. And that's what institutions of higher learning have historically done. Being selective is hard. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to continue to do. We simply don't have the resources right now to do everything that we want. We're still at or near the bottom of our peer group in per year, per student state resources. And yet we're in a ruthlessly competitive uh, environment and market to recruit and retain our faculty. Merely spreading our resources is the surest path to B plus and to mediocrity. Being tough-minded and selective will be the hallmark that distinguishes between public universities that thrive and those that don't. But being tough-minded and being disciplined is only half the recipe. Tough-mindedness without a vision is hollow. We need always to focus on what it is that we're trying to accomplish, what it is we're trying to produce. What outcomes are we trying to achieve? Concepts like return on investment and productivity and efficiency are by their very definition relationships, relationships between inputs and outputs. <clears throat> They're literally meaningless without defining the results we seek to attain. We need a vision for those outputs, 
or all of the tough-mindedness will be for naught. Most of the debate about higher education in America today is about this very point. What we should be seeking is innovative leadership from our students in the future and cutting edge advances in knowledge that will drive our economy and our civic life for decades to come. These are the proper outputs of a world-class teaching and research university. And I'd like to illustrate this by talking about fractals. What's a fractal? A fractal is a mathematical construct where the shape is replicated at every level of magnification. The front of your program has a fractal on it. Take a moment and look at that fractal. It's a star. But magnify the star, and each line is not just a straight line, but itself is made up of smaller stars. And the lines of those stars are stars, and so on forever. Every level of magnification, every level of detail resonates. Now, what in the world does any of this have to do with what we do at UT? It's pretty abstract, but bear with me. It means that we always need to make decisions about our more detailed designs with an eye toward what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to do in our more large-scale mission. And conversely, we need to make decisions about how we design our large-scale structure with an eye toward what's being done in the details on the ground. Now, in my own discipline of law, there's a classic hypothetical case designed to instruct students about the legal method or what it means to think like a lawyer. So a city passes an ordinance that says no vehicles in the park. Language is inherently ambiguous, so questions arise about skateboards, baby strollers, old military equipment on display, bicycles. Are they prohibited? Now, we could try to define vehicle in an abstract way. It transports people or goods. It has wheels or runners or wings and so on. But we could also ask why we have that law in the first place. What was its purpose? If it's to create fresh air, bic bicycles shouldn't fall under its edict. But if it's to create uh, safety for children playing, well, then maybe bicycles should. Neither purpose seems to implicate exhibits of old military equipment. But if the purpose is to preserve a bucolic space, then they might be excluded as well. Now, this approach doesn't end the debate. We might still disagree about the purpose. But it does force us always to ask why we're doing something when, on a more detailed level, we're trying to determine how to go about it. That's a bit like a fractal. At the large scale level, we're often asked to justify the kind of education that we offer at a teaching and research university. And we say that producing new knowledge is critical to the future of our state and to our country. The teaching undergraduate students in a research environment prepares them for creative and innovative careers. And that educating the next generation of researchers in our graduate programs is essential if we want this virtuous cycle to continue. Now, as I've said before, we have an odd case to make. We take young people in the productive part of their life out of the workforce to educate them for four years, or even longer for our graduate students. We take our best researchers and thinkers and allow them to work on esoteric problems that may have no short-term practical payoff. Now, why do we do this? because we think those students will be more creative and innovative in the future. 
It won't be the immediate knowledge and skills they learn. It'll be their analytic ability and their creativity. We think that our researchers, in the aggregate and in the long run, will advance the base of knowledge from which technological innovation will grow in the future. We think our humanists will create a better civic life. And research universities have a good record of that. Just think of what the world would be like if at some point in the past we thought we knew enough and stopped doing research. What would the world be like without Einstein's work on relativity? Well, I can tell you. We wouldn't have GPS systems today. What would the world be like without Watson and Crick's work on the double helix geometry of DNA? We wouldn't have genome uh, sequencing. Apple didn't discover the basic science that led to the iPhone. University researchers who had no interest in iPhones, they did that. As Linda Addison asked when she became a distinguished alumna, how different would the course of history be had someone said to Copernicus, well, just don't worry about whether the planets revolve around the Earth or the sun. And our students who learn in this environment go on to creative and innovative lives of leadership. Where will we be at the Texas Bicentennial if we shortchange the future now by not doing the basic research and not educating our students in that research environment. Now, all of this should sound familiar. It's the broad outline for the value proposition of a great research and teaching university, a university like UT. I believe in it deeply. I've staked my reputation on it. My observation here is that we need to take this vision of our large-scale mission and drive it down into every detailed decision we make about how we implement our programs. Let me give a few examples from our current work. The Freshman Research Initiative in the College of Natural Science is tightly aligned with the goal of teaching our students to solve problems and create new solutions. Now, lectures by faculty who create the knowledge are good experiences in and of themselves for our students. But they give our students just the product of that research. They don't expose our students to the process of research with all its dead ends, failures, and frustrations. The Freshman Research Initiative, the way it's designed, does exactly that. So we get more bang for our buck by designing the FRI the way we do. And in fact, I think we need to expand this concept into other areas, including the humanities. We say we want to teach critical thinking and oral and written communication. So we actually design the signature course with those inputs, uh, so with those outputs in mind. The subject matter isn't the goal, so we don't specify it. Designing these courses with an eye toward our goals has been critical in their success. I actually teach a signature course, a course called What Makes the World Intelligible. We read Oedipus and Hamlet, the Book of Job, Plato, Dostoevsky, and others. How does the world look different when we explain it through the vo voice of science, or the voice of God, or through free will? How does science and religion and the humanities try to accommodate these tensions? But the real goal isn't that subject matter. The real goal is increasing the student's ability to think creati creatively and to communicate. And just three weeks ago in that class, I had a prolonged discussion with one of our students in her third week of college. And that discussion had its dead ends and its eddies and its false starts and it's epiphany. And then we actually talked in class about the discussion itself. Had we wasted our time? And the student and the other students thought not. 
She and the rest of the class thought we'd made a lot of progress. Progress on how you actually do go about making progress. You don't just learn results. You struggle to find them. Well, for a teacher, it doesn't get any better than that. That detailed little moment resonated with the larger goal of the signature courses. And in turn, that goal resonated with the larger goals we espouse when we talk about undergraduate education at a research university. Just learning another fact about Oedipus wouldn't have done that. Now the question is whether we're doing that in every area of our curriculum. Requiring students to take breadth breath courses, why do we do that? It's motivated by a desire to expose these students to the thought processes of discipline, disciplines outside their chosen field. But when we design these breadth courses, do we actually have those goals in mind? Do English majors really need to learn how to integrate trigonometric equations? Are engineers well served by taking a course about a single author from the 19th century and its literature? If a breadth course is just the same as a course in its major, is that really a breadth course? Wouldn't we further the goals of these breadth courses and further them better if English students learned, yes, something about how the calculus works, but they also learned something about number theory? Why there are more real numbers than rational numbers about statistical reasoning and topology and about n-dimensional spaces? Why don't we have a course in which, science, in which scientists learn how poetry works and how the novel or the short story speak differently from poetry and how a third-person narrative works differently from a first-person narrative? Now, in some areas, we do this well as in many of our astronomy courses and science courses that are actually designed for non-majors. My point here is we just need to do more of that in every area of our curriculum. And I'm happy to say that in math and English, our faculty are actually working on these issues. Even in courses for majors, are we just driven by gro the growing need for coverage and coverage of expanding areas? Or are we, are we pruning that material so we can also focus on problem solving and, analy and analytical skills, the goals we claim to be pursuing. And I think all of that is actually related to discussions about productivity. It's what discussions about productivity should be about. We need to make sure our detailed designs are producing the things we want to produce on that larger scale, that every investment we make, including our teaching time and our students' learning time, that every investment we make advances the large-scale vision we have for our outputs. And we need to do that in a disciplined, tough-minded way. If we're going to focus on being productive and being efficient, that is the right approach. We need to do more than just focus on the cost side, simply making our work as cheap as possible. We'll make more progress by making sure that what we're doing at the detailed level is tightly aligned with the overall outputs we think a teaching and research university ought to be producing. Just think about my example of the breadth courses. Other than startup costs, a newly designed math or English breadth course wouldn't add much to our marginal cost. Students would just take those courses rather than another section of the traditional course for majors. When you think about it, that is a dream for productivity. Increased outputs with negligibly increased inputs. Now let me express some important caveats here. All of this is complicated immensely by the fact that we don't have a single goal for what we're doing. We have multiple goals, and they're contested, and they're debated. We won't always agree about the details, 
My point here is about our approach. We need to always have an eye on our goals when we do the more detailed work of actually designing our curriculum and our courses. Put another way, we need to push our debate about how to teach our students into every nook and cranny of our curriculum. And we need to be relentless about that. We also need to remember, as another caveat, that our outputs come not just from one class, but from a four-year experience and an entire ecosystem of learning. The issue isn't just whether every individual class is better designed or taught in one way or another, but whether the ecosystem is well designed to produce the outputs that we desire. Are the pathways through the curriculum designed to give our students the variety of experience that will serve them well? If we aspire to instill leadership and ethics, why don't we give credit one of our most important inputs for experiences in leadership, such as student government or other organizations, in internships, or even being TAs in signature courses or flipped classrooms? And technology can be used to surround these experiences with material on psychology, and sociology, and ethics. Technology might also allow us to augment experience, experiences our students have off the campus, such as summer tours of museums, extended stays at historical sites or geological sites. Surround them with the appropriate content and exercises. And if these pathways foster four-year graduation, so much the better. And focusing our goals in this way can help us decide how and when to use technology. So in some courses, like the wonderful Business Foundations course in the McComb School, that's designed to familiarize students with basic concepts. These courses don't seek to make them experts. So designing those courses and deciding whether to deliver them through uh, technology might call for a different approach in the overall ecosystem than courses in the major. Well, so far I've tried to look at the fractal through one end of the telescope. The large scale pattern repeats itself as we focus in on the detailed structure. But we also need to look through the other end of the telescope. The detailed structure is what builds up into the large-scale structure. I said we need to do our detailed work always with an eye toward our large-scale goals. But when we're dealing with those large-scale goals and our large-scale patterns throughout higher education, we also need to look at the fine structure and take lessons from the people who are doing the actual work of teaching and research. It's not for administrators to design courses. Faculty do that. Any organization that doesn't listen to the people who do the actual work does that at its peril. <clears throat> Learning to think creatively and solve problems, for example, may be different in physics from in history. Physicists and historians know how to design those courses and those curricula. The best designs will come when the large-scale goals are informed by the details, and in turn, when the details are informed by the large-scale structure and its goals. In something like what the philosopher John Rawls would have called a reflective equilibrium. You know, the great Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, closed his poem among school children with these lines. O oh, chestnut tree, great-rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? Well, we can't know the dancer from the dance. They're intertwined. The dancer makes the dance, and the dance makes the dancer. Our dancers are our faculty. They make the dance. We need to remember that. But when they do their work, they too should be thinking about the large-scale structure 
of the dance itself and the goals of that dance that they're participating in. And in fact, we're trying to do just that on our campus. <clears throat> Over the last year and for the remainder of this academic year, we're engaged in what we're calling a campus conversation, a campus conversation about teaching and about our curriculum, including how we might better use technology. Just over two weeks ago, the campus conversation had a day-long discussion among 150 of our most innovative faculty. It was a remarkable event. I dare say nowhere else in America could you find that many faculty spending an entire Friday engaged in a discussion about how to better design undergraduate education? It was truly heartwarming. And the discussion focused on the right goals. And I'm happy to say it, it exemplified the point, the point about the fractals that, about, that I've been trying to make here. It focused on granulated operational ways we can implement our curriculum so that it actually produces the results we aspire to. Innovative problem solving, collaborative cross-disciplinary work, leadership, and communication skills. It connected detailed implementation with global vision. And it also used detailed examples to help us shape that global vision. Many good ideas surfaced, including the need to continue this conversation with students and alumni. It was inspiring, as I said, and it'll be a major focus of our campus during the coming academic year. And three particular points stuck in my mind. All three recognized that innovation best comes from the ground up, from people on the front line. Yes, leadership can set the tone, set the structure, and provide resources. But curriculum and teaching innovations will come from the faculty. Now to do this, we first need to give our faculty more flexibility. They can't innovate if our rules are so inflexible that degree requirements and rules about faculty teaching loads stifle them. How do we count team teaching or structure learning experiences that don't easily fit into 50-minute, three-day-a-week segments? We simply need to give our faculty more flexibility to be creative. Second, how we keep score makes a big difference. Just consider what tennis would be like if one double fault automatically lost the set. Or what football would be like if an intercepted pass cost you 21 points. I dare say servers and quarterbacks would be pretty conservative. The metrics we use to judge our faculty make a difference. Do these metrics encourage taking risks, or do they stifle creativity? And third, we need to give innovative faculty and innovative departments safe havens to fail. Innovation always involves some failure. We won't benefit from the, successful, from the successes of innovation if we all live in fear of an overly punitive regime of regulations. Herb Kelleher, former chairman and CEO of Southwest Airlines, wanted gate agents to be more initiative and take more initiative. For example, if an incoming plane was late, should they hold the connecting flights, risking further problems downstream? Or should they send them, risking stranding the incoming passengers? Herb wanted gate agents to decide not to be paralyzed until someone higher up made that decision. So a flight destined for Long Island was forced to divert to Baltimore because of bad weather. And it was late, and there were no more flights departing for the night. And the youngest 
most junior agent, still a probationary employee, had to deal with the stranded customers. So on her own, she just chartered three buses to transport all those customers to Long Island so they could sleep in their own beds that night. And she did it without any regard for the expense to the airline. So she was summoned to Dallas, which probably made her a bit apprehensive. And she, when she arrived at the corporate headquarters, she discovered that she was the guest of honor at a party just for her. Herb Keller dis, uh, celebrated her decisiveness and her courage and her heart. And he wanted everyone else to be more like her. She took a risk, and Herb backed her. We all need to be more like Herb Kelleher. Sometimes you have to take risks. Sometimes our faculty and departments will have to take risks to get the job right. We won't get innovation if everyone's afraid of getting slapped every time an experiment in innovation doesn't work. Now let me turn to how this approach might work for research. We do apply, uh, important applied and basic research that changes the world for the better, both in the sciences and in the humanities. Supporting that mission, both here and across the country at Tier 1 teaching and research universities, might be our single most important challenge over the next decade. Administrators shouldn't direct how individual faculty structure their research or the questions that they ask. But we do need to make broad brush decisions about what areas to support and how our research effort aligns with our teaching mission. As I've said on many occasions, teaching and research are complementary at a great research university. But it would be stunning if there were an exactly isomorphic one-to-one -one match between the subject areas we need to do more teaching and the subject areas where we need to do more research. We already recognize this in competency courses like beginning foreign languages and technical writing. But even in broad areas, our emphasis might be more on teaching in one area, more on research in another. To match our implementation strategies with our aspirations about our output, we need to have our faculty profile match our overall goals. Some departments or areas need a higher percentage of tenure, tenure track faculty. While other areas need a higher percentage of lecturers. We just don't have the resources to do everything in every field. And we are so blessed here at UT by having a superb, stable, professional group of faculty who are lecturers, senior lecturers, and distinguished senior lecturers. We have career tracks, and in certain cases, job security. And these faculty serve the university in many ways, including doing research. But they focus mainly on our teaching mission. So we are way ahead of the game on this issue. But to be more productive in our teaching and research missions, we'll have to do more and in a more granulated way to make sure we're aligning our teaching and research workforce to the specific ways different departments contribute to the goals of our teaching and research missions. And even on the issue of tenure itself, usually a third rail for any discussion on a college campus we can bring this approach. Now, the institution of tenure has served American universities for a long time. It is certainly a critical tool for individual schools to compete for the best faculty. But it also has costs. It's a form of institutional leverage, like debt or any long-term contract, that locks institutions into long-term relationships and arrangements that might become out of kilter with the needs of a changing student body and changing research needs. Coupled with the federal law that we can't have a mandatory retirement age, it also presents a barrier 
for young aspiring scholars to embark on teaching careers. But rather than debate these issues in an all or nothing fashion, we should be implementing our system, the details of our system, in a way that looks to the purposes that tenure serves. And in fact, we already do that. American higher education, and UT included, has been using an increasing share of non-tenured faculty, focusing mainly on the teaching mission. And so in this sense, American higher education has been detenuring itself, that is, unleveraging itself, for the last 20 years. My point here is that we need to do this in a purposeful way that's aligned with our large-scale teaching and research goals. Not just across the campus, but with an eye to the details in different departments and different areas. We need to use tenure where it's most needed, where competition is keenest and where research is more central to the enterprise. It's less central, it's less necessary when these two features aren't present. And again, my point isn't that I have the answer here. My point is that we can't shy away from this issue, an issue even as sacred as tenure. We need to lead the way by implementing every single thing we do in light of the purposes, the larger scale goals that we claim that promotes. And there are a host of other issues we face in designing our academic programs. Which graduate programs are more critical to our teaching mission and which are more critical to our research mission? Which programs are more critical to our mission of teaching undergraduates and which are more important at the graduate level? We will always need a campus conversation to look at the details and our larger structure goals to sort out these issues. But we won't sort them out in a way that makes us better, in a way that makes us more productive, if we focus on our goals and aspirations only at the broadest and abstract level. We need to have an eye to our purposes and our aspirations when we make all of these detailed decisions about how we implement our academic programs. As I tried to illustrate by my earlier example of the vehicles in the park and my allusion to the fractals. Then we'll design better programs. We'll be more productive and more, more efficient and we'll become the best public university in America. This is the way we can think about being more productive in a way that resonates with the soul of a great teaching and research university. Now there's one more ingredient we need for success. Design can do a lot, but it can't do everything. We sorely need adequate resources, both for recurring operations and for capital projects. I said earlier that we are at or near the bottom of our peer group in terms of per year, per student state resources, including general revenue, available university fund proceeds, and tuition. According to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, America has fallen from 10th, I'm sorry, has fallen from second to 10th in research and development expenditures in just 20 years. We need to turn that around. Now some good news comes from the Permian Basin and technological advances in recovery. So I'm optimistic about our future here at UT if we use those assets well and use them in the tough-minded but visionary way that I've tried to outline. And I'm gratified that our regions have actually begun to tap into those resources more strategically. And I applaud them for that. But whatever the source, Texas will thrive at our bicentennial in 2036 only if we invest in our future by investing now in higher education, and for that matter, in public education as well. Now, in terms of the resources that we do have, we're going to continue to use them strategically. 
I began my term as president by focusing resources on core departments to help them get to the very top. We started with math and English and history. But the economic downturn derailed that effort. Even then, we tried to be selective as we tightened our belt. So in the last six months, the provost and I have scoured our budget in an effort to convert more of our one-time resources into recurring budget items, where they can be used to address recurring needs, such as hiring and competitive salaries, graduate student support, and in enriching the academic experience for our undergraduate students. Now, we did this by being more aggressive in our budgeting assumptions. And yes, that does create some risk. But the risk of eroding the quality of our campus is far greater. We'll use that money for a faculty investment initiative. Now, we won't focus on increasing the number of faculty lines right now, but instead use the funds to supplement replacement lines to enhance quality over a five-year period, even including some cluster hires in some key strategic areas. We'll focus on graduate stipends in some key areas. We'll focus on teaching ideas that come out of the campus conversations. And we'll use some of the money for broader salary support. The provost will lead this effort, and he'll have more to say about it later in the semester. Now, I've tried to outline an approach for solving some of the challenges we face at UT and in higher education. We're a world-class teaching organization, a world-class research and teaching university. We discover new ways of doing things. We need to lead the way on these issues I've been talking about as well, on how a great teaching and research university will operate in the future. How will it organize and deliver its education? How will it do its research? How will it teach? And how will it connect these functions? How will it address affordability? How will it improve student success? And critically, how will it do these things consistent with the soul of what a teaching and research university ought to be. Now, we read with pride, and rightly so, the achievements of our faculty and our students in their respective areas of expertise. We need also to take pride in showing the way forward on issues of how higher education will be operated and structured in the 21st century. One of my greatest moments of pride as the president of UT was opening the New York Times Magazine earlier this year to see the cover story on David Lowdy and our student success programs. We need to be the best public university in America on these issues, too. And why shouldn't we be? As Jeremy Surrey asked in the campus conversation, why not us? And why not now? Well, why not? Why shouldn't we be the best on these issues, too? Well, I want to close with just a bit more about fractals and how fractals invite us to reflect on the details as we contemplate larger structures. Earlier this month, I was thinking about our capital campaign, as I'm sure many of you have as well. It's easy to focus on the staggering statistics, $3.1 billion. But let me suggest you do something else. Go to the James and Miriam Mulva ROTC Center on the fourth floor of the new Liberal Arts Building and just sit there for a half an hour and watch the cadets going about their business. Go to the visualization lab in the O'Donnell Building and see how it's transforming computational analysis in science and engineering. Go watch students rehearsing an opera at the Butler School of Music. Watch students on the main mall 
and ask yourself how they would be affected if they didn't have that scholarship. Those details and more are what the, campus, what the campaign for Texas was all about. And when I think about the soul of UT, our star in the fractal, I think about the details too and the people. I think about the student I had in class 20 years ago who I meet out around the state who's now out changing the world. About Professor Mark Raisins capturing individual atoms at near absolute zero in his physics lab. About Professor Maria Younger fascinating a group of faculty around my dinner table one night with her work on, of all things, concrete. I think about my student in my signature course who came to UT to be in the band and was baffled by aspects of Oedipus and then became a student leader three years later. I think about going to New York to see Professor Ted Gordon's father's collections of paintings and drawings by Charles White. And I think about sitting with those crazy hellraisers who paint their chests T-E-X-A-S. And I think about lunches with our staff council executive committee. And here, at, let me add a further word about our staff. With all the cutbacks and all the budget challenges, our staff have had a tough time. They have been absolutely fantastic. We come to campus every day and sometimes take for granted that things work. Things work here at UT because of our staff. If we're going to be the best public university in America, and we will be, it'll be because of the details in the fractal from which the larger st structure emerges. It'll be about the people. As I said earlier, 37 years ago, I fell in love with UT. A lot went into that, but nothing more than our people. Our amazing students, our unbelievably talented faculty, our innovative and hardworking staff, and our truly astonishing alumni and friends. I know all too well what all of you have done for me. And many of you are in this room today. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you. God bless you and hook them horns.